incoming board, board chair, um, I'd like to say just a couple of things. Um, as you all know, this is an amazing organization. The NRPC serves as a key link between the state and municipalities in Franklin and Grand Isle counties. And our work is critical to the region's progress. We are blessed with an outstanding executive director, a high performing staff, and a group of very dedicated and active commissioners. I'm honored to be the new chair and I'll try to continue the excellent work that Bill Irwin has done for the last three years. And since this is my first meeting as chair, please go easy on me. The next item is uh, introductions. And um, as you know, Bill would invite individual commissioners to introduce themselves, which could be challenging as he tried to keep track of individuals bouncing around the Zoom screen. I'm not nearly as adept at doing that and would like to try something new, which is to call out each um, municipality in alphabetical order and then ask the associated commissioners to identify themselves and where there are two to do so in alphabetical order. And after we get through the municipalities, I'll call on Catherine who will manage staff introductions. And if this doesn't work well, we can go back to the old way and I'll uh, follow the bouncing ball. So th with that, I'm gonna start calling out um, uh, municipalities and folks can uh, chime in if they're present. The first one is Alberg Town. We have anybody? Hearing none, um, the next one is Alberg Village and I don't think there are any representatives. So I think uh, we can- uh, Peter, Alex, just from Albert Town, just oh, joined. Okay, great. Um, next one is Bakersfield. Hi, Bill Irwin, Bakersfield. Call Bakersfield. Berkshire. Hearing none from Berkshire, Enosburg Falls. Uh, next one is Enosburg Town. All right, Fairfax. Barbara Murphy from Fairfax. Next one is Fairfield. Chuck Putterber, Fairfield. Julia Callen, Fairfield. Mike. Fletcher. Uh, Lori Rupel, Fletcher. Franklin. Yvonne Danren, Town of Franklin. Georgia. Carl Rosenquist, Georgia. Kirk Waite, Georgia. Grand Isle. Howard Demars, Grand Isle. Barkley Morris, Grand Isle. Highgate. I was going to have Sharon go first. I'm Jack Pelkey, uh, Highgate. Hi, Lamont. Montgomery. North Hero. Andy Alling, North Hero. Mike Curtis, North Hero. Richford. Sheldon, South Hero, Peter Zamor for South Hero, and Bob's not here. Uh, St. Albans City. Elizabeth Nance. St. Albans Town. Megan Sherland. Swanton Town. Earl Garrett, Swanton Town. And Swanton Village. I think you are on mute, Heidi. I am, sorry. Heidi Bridge Valenta with the village of Swanton. Okay, are there any other municipal representatives that um, didn't chime in? Uh, Peter, um, Sharon Bosquet, the Highgate Town Administrator and Representative is trying to um, log in. 
She's having okay. some connect connectivity issues. Great, thank you. Uh, and I was a moment late, but Alex McCracken, Town of Alberg. Great. Um, feel free to uh, email me with any thoughts on how this went. And with that, I will um, hand it over to Catherine. Um, so do you want to go Bethany, Greta, Sean? However you want to do it, sure. Hi, everyone. Bethany Remmer, Assistant Director. Greta Brunswick, Hi. Senior Planner. Sean Coleman, senior planner. And I um, see Dean has joined too. Dean Pierce, senior planner. And I'm Catherine Dubitrick, executive director. Okay, anyone else in attendance that hasn't uh, been recognized? Uh, then we'll go on to opportunity for public comment. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, then we go to NRPC Regional Plan Amendment hearing. And my understanding is that there's no action to take at this time. Uh, Catherine, I don't know if you want to uh, embellish on that at all. Sure. So this uh, was originally scheduled as our final public hearing prior to a vote on adopting the energy plan as an amendment to the regional plan. Um, since we were in the hearing, we uh, identified a couple of technical issues that the public service department brought to our attention that would make it so they could not give us a positive determination of energy compliance. None of those issues change the meaning or intent of the plan. They're simply corrections we need to make. So we've gone ahead and made those uh, corrections and warned a new hearing, which will enable us to have a vote at the next board meeting, which is scheduled for September. Other than those comments from the Department of Public Service, we've had no additional comments on the energy plan and the amendment as warned. Um, so that is the only additional changes we've made. Unlike local plans, which allow you to make changes to the plan as long as they're not substantial before you vote, regional plans, the statute says, if you make any changes, you have to have another hearing. And so it's our determination that these, even though they're technical corrections, they do require us to have another hearing. Happy to answer questions, but that's where we stand on it. <laughs> any questions? Okay, uh, next we have the minutes of the June 2024 meeting. Um, are there any comments or suggested changes on the draft minutes that are in the book? I, I would like to make a, a suggestion that uh, on the last page, election of officers and representatives for fiscal year 2025, that we might want to list who was elected to which position as part of the minutes. Excellent. Other than that, I yeah. would make a motion to accept them. <laughs> okay, is there a second? I'll, Elizabeth will second. Um, I apologize, my um, camera doesn't work on this computer. Um, I did send a couple of comments that are not substantive um, on the minutes to Catherine and Bethany. Um, just a couple of typographical sort of things. Okay. Um, nice to have you back, Elizabeth. You've always been <laughs> extremely good at that. Yes, yeah, she you. has been. I agree. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, okay. Any other uh, comments or suggestions? Um, we've got a motion in, and we have a second. Um, so any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of approving the minutes uh, as uh, adjusted uh, just with the conversation right now, signify by saying aye. 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 Nay. Any abstentions? The motion carries. The next item are the commissioner reports, which are um, written reports are in the uh, board book. And um, we'd like to hear from anyone who feels the need to supplement what's in the written reports. And I'll just um, go through each of the reports and see if anyone has anything to say. Finance and operations, Kirk? Nothing to report. 
personnel, Bob Bierman's not here. Anybody else want to report for him or have anything to say? Executive, um, I don't have anything to add to what was in the report. Next one is project review, Harold. Uh, <clears throat> nothing to report. Uh, there's no action to be taken on our two projects. I, I I did have a question, Harold, on the Act 250 Sandy Birch LLC. Um, why did the committee vote to remove the condition of the extension of the sidewalk? Uh, <clears throat> there was a lengthy discussion on that, Kirk, and uh, the town apparently has agreed that uh, the slope is too deep to uh, allow, it would take too much fill and everything to continue the sidewalk, if my recollection is correct. And uh, so the town said that they were good not having, but it was a lengthy discussion and uh, some of us were definitely in favor of having the sidewalks, but uh, uh, because the town said it was, you know, the, the drop off was way too deep to, to fill in that uh, we agreed with the town. Okay, so I, I must be thinking of a different place. I run by there almost every day and it's not very deep. Um, <laughs> but, but the other concern I have is the strong recommendation. Georgia typically doesn't stripe their secondary roads. So I don't know how, what good signage and striping is gonna do. Right, uh, that was, uh, uh, I, I know the uh, uh, committee discussed it in length at about uh, how the people are going to get from the first project to the second where the uh, common ground was. And uh, uh, so they said, well, maybe the signage would help. But I, I, I myself, uh, I spent a long time, Kirk, uh, I used to plow that road back a few years ago, and I don't really remember it. But uh, uh, I probably would agree with you that signage may not help, but uh, I don't remember the big drop off. Uh, so I couldn't say for or against because it, uh, if the town hadn't signed off, I, uh, we would I think the committee would have said, yes, they need sidewalks. Okay, I'm just curious, it uh, doesn't make sense to me right. based on my knowledge of the area. Yeah, well, thank and you. and the fact that the town doesn't stripe roads, so I don't know what good a strong recommendation is going to do. Right, right. Uh, thank you for your comments, and uh, I uh, wish you would have been able to log in that night to, to give us a little feedback. Thanks. Okay, um, next one is uh, TAC, Harold again. <clears throat> We met and uh, we've come up with a uh, the work plan for the ensuing year. And uh, is that on the agenda for tonight to be approved by the commissioners? Yes, it so, is. Uh, it was recommended that uh, uh, we pass it on to the full board. Okay. N next one is Brownfields Committee, Megan. We did not meet this month that we have a proposed or our next meeting is on September 16th. Regional plan and policy, Lori. We haven't met. Vermont Economic Progress Council, Barbara. I was all set to go to the meeting right after our last board meeting and then found out from Catherine that unless we have a project, it's really not something that's done. So I didn't. And then this month's got canceled. So I have nothing to report. Green Mountain Transit, Bob's not here. Catherine, do you have anything on that? Nothing in addition to what's in the written report. Healthy Roots, Marietta. Marietta's not here, but I can report right. that health, Healthy Roots staff made the full transition to CBOEO on the 22nd of this month, and we're in the process of doing an asset long-term lease so they can use the assets as well. And uh, the Northwest Vermont Regional Foundation, Kirk? Nothing to report this month. 
Okay, then we can turn to the staff reports. Is there anything that the staff wants to supplement from what's in the reports or add further information or any uh, questions that commissioners may have? I have one, uh, Peter, for Catherine, and I guess on the a little oddly healthy routes. Are they still going to utilize our, our facility or is everything going to be outsourced? They won't really have a need to use our office or garage. They currently still have stuff stored in the garage as they're looking to, um, you know, gradually move it to new locations with CBOEO. Um, so they won't be using our spaces regularly. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it was a great uh, project and uh, I'm a little sad to see them leave. Yeah, we're sad to see them go too, but I think uh, it's going to be a great opportunity at CBOEO, and they, of course, can come and use our office anytime they want. <laughs> Anything else on staff reports? Hearing none, the next, oh, excuse me, did somebody say something? Well, I was just going to say, at the TAC meeting, Sean gave us a really good overview of all of the damage from the July 10th storm, I believe it was. Um, and I was personal Hill Valley Rail Trail, and I wondered if he has any updated information on how badly it got hammered um, the other night in the St. Johnsbury area. Um, I don't have any um, detail on the rail trail. I'm not sure if Bethany's heard anything. Amy, the rail trail coordinator, is out on um, this week. She's away, so I I haven't seen anything too specific, other than the you know the rail lines themselves getting hammered um, up in St. J. Lindenville. Yeah. I wonder if it'll ever stop. I know, I just know just because I was there the other night, the rail trail in Cambridge, um, it was over by Yana's cupboard was uh, was closed, or what is it now, the cupboard deli or whatever it's called. Um, there, the the access was closed. So I'm, I'm not sure how extensive the damages were. And, and I just, this is Bethany, I just included um, the link to the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail website where they're, the the trans is keeping up to date on what sections of the trail are currently closed. Thank you. And I just, just wanted to say, Sean, you're right, because I believe in Vermont, we're supposed to re refer to property by two previous owners, rather than the current owner. I didn't catch all that, Barkley. You were Isn't that a Vermont tradition? <laughs> when you yeah. called it Yana's, Oh, I said yeah. you were right because we're always supposed to refer three, three by two previous owners instead of the current owner. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I there was a we had, we did have like a National Weather Service briefing um this afternoon with the EMDs uh statewide, uh just about the storm cells that are moving through the uh the state, northwest, northeast part of the state, excuse me, through the, mostly the kingdom. Um, and uh, anywhere from one to three inches additional rain tonight. And I think that Steve Whitaker from the National Weather Service put it, I think anything, um, I think it was one to one and a half inches in the St. Johnsbury area within an hour would lead to flash flooding. And then anything over three inches of rain over or under a three hour, not over, but under a three hour period would lead to flash flooding in St. J. But it looked like that the areas that were hit Monday night by the cells that blew through here that caught everybody off guard. Um, looks like they're going to probably get some more rain, definitely some greater precipitation tonight, according to the Steve Whitaker at the Weather Service office in Burlington, the NOAA service. Thank you. Okay, anything else on staff reports? And I'll just I'll just throw out there really quick too, because I, I talked to Reg Beliveau, 
Jr., who is the EMD for Swanton Town and Village. He works for the Division of Fire Safety, and he was covering Plainfield today. He was in Lindenville yesterday, and he was telling me and talking to the the he was working for the State Recovery Center in in Lindenville, and then in Plainfield today. And in Lindenville, they were saying, um, I believe that there were fifty homes and businesses that were damaged or destroyed. And then I think in um, in Morgan, I think they were looking at, they didn't say specifically what kind of buildings or structures, but a hundred structures were damaged or destroyed in that area. And just sections of road with houses that were on, and you've all seen the news, they, they can't put the road back because there's no place to put the road. And some of the, like this one of the main roads had about, uh, a dozen or so houses on it and most of the houses have to be removed um, so it's just absolutely devastating uh damages that we're experiencing this summer again but i'm sure you're probably seeing a lot of it on social media or on the news so i'll stop <laughs> okay um uh, turning now, we get the next agenda, agenda item is the um, um, committee assignments. Uh, no, excuse me, the legislative overview, which, uh, Catherine, you're going to handle? I am, yes. So, uh, okay. So, the legislature was really busy this session on bills that impact us <laughs> and the work that we do. So I thought it would be helpful to take a few minutes tonight and go through the major bills that impact our work. I'll spend most of my time talking about uh, Act 181, which was the Act 250 bill, but then I'll also touch on some other bills really briefly. Hey, boo. There we go. Okay, so the Act 250 bill, is, it was known, the whole session is age 687 and now is Act 181, has six main components ranging from municipal plans and regulations all the way up to a long list of about a dozen studies and reports that need to be done by different state agencies and boards, including one by the regional planning commissions. In the first uh, section, one section of the bill, it relates to municipal zoning regulations. And these are some additional regulations that were done following up from the HOME Act last year. We're gonna be having a zoning administrators round table to go over these in great detail with our zoning administrators so they're familiar with them. Um, but primarily it's related to accessory on-farm businesses, which used to be um, have special consideration under zoning if 50% of the income was made from products on the farm and that rule has, is now gone and relaxed. There's additional clarifications on duplexes and multifamily dwellings, including uh, so regulations on um, preventing towns from regulating unrelated occupants. And there's some additional clarifications on parking bylaws and effective dates related to parking. And there's some new changes in local decision-making processes. The first is that all either zoning board, DRB or planning commission has to have their permit hearings within 120 days of the application being deemed complete. It's not a decision-making time clock. It's when you have to start the hearing process. And then appeals, it used to be 10 people could band together to an appeal, a local permit, and now it's 20 people. So it increased the number of people who can appeal local permits. And so now the big one that really impacts the work that we do here at the Regional Planning Commission, there were changes made to the local and regional planning goals. This impacts both local and regional plans that the land use plans have to provide for land area that would accommodate a substantial majority of the housing that's needed based on the housing targets that are completed by the regional planning commissions. So in there, there's two things. One, we'll have to make sure our land use plans accommodate the housing, but two, we will with our next regional plan amendment be using um, regional and statewide housing targets to develop local housing targets. 
uh, based on the future need that's planned for our region. And additionally, with the regional plan, there's a new requirement with our future land use element. When we do our future land use plans, now there'll be 10 land use categories. Those will be consistent statewide. So every regional planning commission will have a regional plan that has the same land use categories. And those land use plans will now serve as the foundation for the state designation program. So the downtowns, villages, new neighborhoods, growth centers, as well as what's called Act 250 tiers, which is really determining when Act 250 jurisdiction kicks in. So our land use maps now, which are pre, which are aspirational and come into play um, from a policy perspective in Act 250 only under criteria 10, now will be much more important. Their importance will be elevated. They'll be used for state incentive programs as well as determining a location-based application of Act 250 rather than what exists now, which is a size of project application of Act 250. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in addition, there are some changes to the regional plan process. So there's a requirement for meaningful participation and a link to Vermont's environmental justice laws. There's some additional municipal notice that needs to happen. And then there's a new land use review board, which is a new board made up of five members. And that's the state board that's going to have the job of approving our regional plans. Now, the only approval that we get is an optional approval for positive energy determination. But because our regional plans will now serve as the basis for the state designation incentive program, and they'll help determine Act 250 jurisdiction, there will be a new state level approval process to our regional plans. So for the future land use plans that we will do, these are the 10 land use categories that we will now be using for our future land use plans. The downtowns and village centers are primarily what you would know now as your state designated downtown or village if you have one, which most of our municipalities do. So it's that really tight, compact, mostly commercial center of our downtowns and villages. The planned growth areas are the for the larger municipalities, the high density areas around those compact centers. Um, and then the village areas are the smaller scale version of that in our smaller villages. There's also a transition or infill area, and those are a couple of different things there. It's either areas that don't have development now, that are planned for future growth. It could be areas that are currently strip development that are looking to transition into more of the mixed use plan growth and village areas. Or they could be places where a municipality is looking to actually you know, relocate out of a flood zone if necessary. Resource-based recreation areas are primarily ski areas, but in our region could be something like um, the Tyler Place. Enterprise areas are industrial parks, um, land extraction, those sort of um, point-based high-intensity land uses that are outside of our traditional downtowns and villages. Hamlets are your typical crossroad villages. We have a lot of those in our region. We already mapped those in our regional plan. And then there's three different types of rural. One is general rural, which is your traditional low density residential. Sometimes there's there's agricultural lands in there. Sometimes there's recreation. It's kind of the, just that general low density rural area. And then those areas that are important to um, make sure are economically viable for agriculture and forestry. And then the conservation areas, those areas that are the most important in our region that, that should be preserved for conservation uses. So in terms of how those land uses will work for the state designation program, right now, every municipality has to apply separately to the state designation program and they're approved and then renewed every five years. The new system will be that we map those designated areas in our regional plan. And instead of having five different state designation programs, there's only going to be two. The first is going to be centers, and that will include all of our downtowns and village centers that are mapped in the regional plan. And the second designation area is the neighborhoods. So those areas around the compact villages and downtowns that include the mostly residential, lower density, or more scattered commercial 
development. So there'll be those two designations now. Those will be mapped in our regional plan. Once the land use review board approves our regional plan, all the designations are in place. So municipalities no longer have to go through the um, application process, but we instead would be working with our municipal governments, our municipal officials to make sure that the mapped areas uh, meet with the needs of the municipality. And then in terms of how our land use plans will relate to Act 250. So there's now going to be what's called a tiered system in Act 250. Tier one, I'm gonna do it reverse what's on the slide. Tier 1A are the highest density locations in our state with municipalities that have smart, what you could call it smart growth zoning, have adequate municipal capacity, have infrastructure, and go through a process to apply to the land use review board to get their area and their municipality designated as tier 1A. Once that's approved, those areas are completely exempt from Act 250. So no Act 250 applications will be needed in those areas. Tier 1B is um, a more limited Act 250 exemption. So if you have 50 units or fewer of housing on 10 units or less, then in tier 1B areas, you will not need an Act 250 permit. The commercial application, maybe they're one acre or 10 acre will stay the same. The tier 1B areas are mapped by us now in our regional plan. The boundaries would be set by the regional plan. The municipality would have to indicate that they do want to be considered a tier 1B area and the municipality will need to have um, water or sewer or soils that support septic, which is pretty much every village in our area. And they will need to have zoning and subdivision regulation, which does take out some of our municipalities. And so if a municipality wants to be tier 1B, once our maps are approved by the Land Use Review Board, you can build housing in those tier 1B areas 50 units or less on 10 acres or less without needing an Act 250 permit. So the timeline for making all of this happen. So first, uh, by the end of this calendar year, the regional planning commissions are working to take those definitions of the 10 land use areas that are in statute and develop some common mapping standards so that we all apply them in the same way when we develop our regional plans. So the end result of this should be that you take our regional plan and uh, neighbors with Lamoille and NVDA and Chittenden and you can stitch it all together and you're gonna have a statewide um, a map that can show these future land use areas across the state. And then by December of 2026, that is our deadline for doing that next round of amendments to our regional plan where we'll have the updated future land use elements that will serve as the basis for the designations and Act 250 jurisdiction. We'll have an equitable engagement process and we'll also include the housing targets. And then the land use review board that reviews our regional plan will need their, will need a draft 60 days in advance of our first hearing. So that adds two months to our adoption oh, process. So we just need to on that. Okay. Sean, can you mute? mute? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then once the regional planning commission adopts the regional plan, Within 60 days, the Land Use Review Board would have to make a decision either approving or denying the regional plan. Their approval or denial will be based on two things. Um, do the land use, does the land use plan match statute? And does the plan include all of the other required elements, elements that we're not even talking about today, but all of the other 11 or 12 required elements of the regional plan, of the regional plan statute. So there's gonna be a lot of work ahead of us uh, in the Regional Plan and Policy Committee, thank you, Lori, and in the full board as well as staff. And I just wanted to, um, oh, before we I show you a map, um, in addition to these long-term exemptions from Act 250, there is a whole host of interim exemptions to Act 250 that will go into place, that went into place already 
and will stay in place up to 2027 or 2028, depending upon what that is. Um, there are anything from an access, adding an accessory dwelling unit. So if you're in a subdivision that has an Act 250 permit on it because it was built when it needed an Act 250 permit, if you want to build an accessory dwelling unit before this law, you'd have to go through an Act 250 amendment, and now you don't have to. So it's it goes from this small scale of simplifying accessory dwelling units all the way up to um, within what we have in our region, we have growth centers and we will soon have neighborhood development areas. You can build up to 75 housing units with no Act 250 permit. And within a quarter mile of designated villages and the designated village itself, you can build housing projects up to 50 units. That only applies to municipalities with water or sewer or good septic soils and zoning and subdivision. So here's what something like this might look like in the future. <laughs> so this is Richford. And this, I just wanted to show you an example of what it could look like. And um, Lou Slamba, our AmeriCorps person, put this a map together for us. And I use it a lot in legislative conversations. But this is Richard right now. This dark red area in the middle is its designated village. And that would be the village center under these new land use categories. This pink area outside of it is what we would call a village area. And those would be eligible for some more limited exemptions. Uh, taken together, these two areas, the red and the pink would be what would be this tier 1B area where if the municipality wanted to, they could exempt up to 50 units of housing in that red plus pink area. The red slashed areas here are is the quarter mile buffer around the downtown. So under the interim exemptions, this red area plus the red hash area, you can build 50 units of housing. So as of today, in those two areas, you can build up 50 units of housing without needing Act 250. Long term, we would envision it to also include this pink area. This river shaped area is exactly what you would think it is. It's the river corridor. And there's some additional regulations that need to go into play to determine whether um, development in that area is exempt from Act 250. And then finally, you can see the yellow and green areas are the different level of rural and conservation. And then there's three other <laughs> changes I'll talk about. Um, one is that there's a new, there'll be a new habitat connector and forest block criteria added to um, criteria eight under rulemaking. There's a new road rule. So anything over 800 feet for a single driveway or a combination of 2000 feet of roads would be in, would be um, triggering an Act 250 permit. And then long-term uh, as of February, 2026, the Land Use Review Board will identify those areas of the highest critical natural resources that will get some enhanced Act 250 jurisdiction. So that's my version of a 180 page bill. <laughs> I hope it's, a, it's an overview. We're gonna be talking about these in a lot more detail as we work on the regional plan changes. And then super quickly, I just wanted to um, let you see all of the reports that are gonna be done as part of the, the bill. The first two are the ones that are most important for us, the state and regional housing targets that we'll be working on. And then the regional planning commissions were tasked with doing a study to look at how regional planning commissions can most effectively be positioned to serve the state in the coming years. And you'll be hearing more about that too. And then I wanted to hit really quickly on a few more bills that were passed. The first is the open meeting law. And you should have been seeing lots of information about this, but basically, um, if you're if you have a non-advisory body such as a select board of the DRB who can make budgetary or quasi-judicial decisions, then there's no more options for meeting fully virtually. You have to have a physical location, which is why we have folks in the office tonight for our board meeting. Uh, and then you have to record your meetings and post them online for 30 days. Advisory bodies can still have 
remote only meetings. So that's all the other boards and committees at the municipal level. There's a lot more details there, but those are, that's the most important thing. Um, and there's a resource on our website. Secretary of State has a lot of information that's really important to take a look at if you're in charge of helping your municipality meet the open meeting law. There's a new bill on river corridors and wetlands. It's going to update the state river corridor maps. It is going to look at a new state standard for national flood insurance program enrollment. And it's going to look at whether the state should be the one to administer the flood insurance program statewide, similarly to how the state has a shorelands permit. And and then there is a bill related to disaster response and recovery um, that sets up a mitigation fund, which already was tapped into as of yesterday, and um, looks at some changes to the to our response structure in the state. And then there's a county and regional governance study, which is looking at, among other things, um, whether Vermont's lack of county government impacts our ability to take full advantage of all federal programs within the state. That's it, that's a lot. <laughs> Sorry to talk so long, but there was a lot to go through tonight. Um, and we'll send this out and it will have links to the uh, legislative, two different legislative summaries as well as the open meeting law guidance. Catherine, I have two questions. The first one is, could you circulate that presentation to the commissioners? Mm -hmm. I will send it out. And the second one is, uh, there seem to be quite a few additional obligations that are being imposed on us by the legislature. Do they have any budgetary consequences that we're gonna to have to address at some point soon? Um, they do have budgetary consequences. They were incorporated into the budget that we adopted this year. Mm -hmm. I will say that um, Act 181 did include additional funding for the Regional Planning Commission. So we did get a small increase that will help to um, offset the additional costs of redoing our regional plan. Questions or comments from others? So, Bill, I struck by the broad collection of changes and how that might affect bylaws in almost every municipality, because they're all written for different land uses by definition. Is is there going to be help for the municipalities, either from the state, and of course, I would assume we are as well. So the land use categories included in this bill only apply to the Regional Planning Commission. So they only have to be included in the regional plans. And any municipality who wants to do something similar, we would, of course, work with them and help them. The um, local zoning changes, as I noted, um, Greta and Danielle are working on organizing a zoning administrators roundtable where we'll be able to really spend some time delving into those details because they override local zoning. So it doesn't matter what your zoning says now, these these um, new state laws override your zoning. Good to hear. Yes, because Carl. we are going to be overriding um, local zoning. Are, are we going to expect have to expect some pushback from some of the towns. I don't, based on how the land use categories are drafted and what I know about some of our um, land use plans at the local level, I don't think, I think we're really consistent right now. So I think where, where the issues might come to play, the biggest one I foresee is whether something is a planned growth area or a transition area. So that I think there might be some nuance there that we'll have to look to, but I don't, I don't foresee a lot of conflict. I see this more of a collaboration between us and the municipalities. Carl. Hello. Yeah, hi Carl. Hey, thank you. Yes, uh, following up to some extent on Williams comment, but this has more to do with the three three acre rule, which we're dealing with right now. And we continue to have people coming in to our town office saying, what's going on? What? Wh why isn't the town taking care of this? And 
you know, we just had a meeting last night with some property owners and, you know, it's a real big problem right now. How, how do mm -hmm. we try to accomplish the objectives of, of the, uh, of the act, the three acre rule and try to be proactive select board members trying to promote our community and, and helping the members of our community that are now affected. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be useful for the regional planning group to set up a meeting for some of us to help explain this. You know, we're, we go to our lawyers, we go to this and that, but right now, uh, it seems to be sort of disarray. I mean, there's sort of feeling out there that if we don't do anything, or uh, obviously we wouldn't want to advise people to do this, but if they don't do anything, will anything really happen? And the worst thing, as far as we understand it, is that it could be a title issue for people's property in the future going forward. So I I think it's a really serious issue. And many people, there are people in our community have they don't have an association. They don't have anybody to get together with, and they don't want to create an association. They they think it's total bull. And, you know, I, I'm very concerned about this. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping you give me some direction and maybe some guidance and maybe some help going forward. Thank you. That's sure. So for those who don't, don't know what the three acre thing is that Carl's talking about, there is a there is a state permitting requirement to do a stormwater permit and stormwater mitigation if you have more than three acres of impervious soil um, surfaces. And that has hit, in many cases, um, larger subdivisions that have commonly owned infrastructure that um, exceed the three acres of impervious surfaces. I see Dean on camera, uh, uh, turned his camera on just as I was thinking, Dean is the best person to connect with on this outside of the meeting. Dean, did you want anything now? Well, just to briefly say, I'm happy to have conversations with Carl or anyone else. I've had some conversations with officials uh, in Swanton uh, town. And I know um, Heidi has also been involved with some of this through uh, a development, but I wish there were a simple set of um, certainties, but there isn't such a list of certainties. But the short short offer is to um, to set up a time to, to talk with Carl. I can't remember what town Carl is from. Georgia. Georgia. Okay. Georgia. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to set up a time to talk and we can begin to map out what the options are. I think it's going to be a slog. Well, absolutely. I mean, it looks like one. The agency doesn't have the wherewithal to really deal with this issue either. And, you know, right now, I mean, we're coming to people, they received a letter and all of a sudden October 31st or September 1st, which it is, but is around the corner. And if they don't start some action on this and some of them, they don't even have an, an association to deal with this. So, you know, um, they're sort of in a quandary what to do and, and we're we're sort of sitting here. We don't want to take on the total responsibility as a town, obviously, uh, and because it seems to be like a duality thing. The town has, like, well, I think it is fifty percent responsibility for for these impervious surfaces, but the property owners have forty five or fifty percent, as far as I understand it. So, I, I it's a really serious issue. So, Dean. I would really appreciate it if you want to reach out to me or I'll reach out to you. Maybe you could, uh, uh, I think my information's up there, but anyway, it should say Carl Rosenquist. Sorry about that. It just says Carl. Okay. <laughs> sorry. We've got your contact info, Carl. I'm sorry. We've got your contact info. So I'll make sure you and Dean can connect. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, Peter? then yes. I'd like to say, my opinion of this is, uh, you know, I live on an island in the middle of the lake. I've watched the lake quality go down immensely during the period of my life, I'm even. And it's time the state has done something in this three acre rule. Storm runoff is of great concern to me. Uh, protection of class two wetlands, things of this nature. But our state is very good 
at issuing mandates, but very poor at helping municipalities achieve these goals. And Absolutely. Uh, something's something's got to get done about that. You know, I, I'm certainly in favor of these new regulations, but trying to achieve these goals without giving the municipalities the resources is, is clearly unrealistic, you know? So and, I, can, and I, can I would, Yeah, and that, that regional and county governance study, um, when I testified on that bill and to get added in the end, one of the things that I noted is that we shouldn't just be looking at regional and county governance, but we should be asking what what we're, we should be looking at what we're asking our municipalities to do and if that's really the right level to be asking government to do the things that are they're being asked to do it's, it's the old pass the buck thing to the municipalities with no support or you know financially or even yeah. as carl saying understanding the rules completely so yeah. i don't know it's frustrating it really is i understand carl's frustration i do it's very decisive, uh, divisive in our community right now. I can see think, why, Kyle. It's 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 totally you know one one community or uh, what do you call it subdivision is subject to this, and they're asking why right across the street why isn't the other subdivision uh, involved in it in the same way? And quite frankly, I, I have no I have no answer for them. Okay, <laughs> all right. So I mean, it's just a list that came down from the state, and here we are trying to deal with this. So I don't know how you other communities are dealing with it, but if you have some advice for me, please reach out. Thanks. Well, I I would just want to highlight that um, there are uh, funds available to help applicants achieve um, permit obtainment. So uh, there's a 49999 grant for um, design permit fees, et cetera, that is open now. And I think Bethany might have just forwarded that around to municipalities. So I, I would encourage, a, it's a very simple application and um, the, money's, the money's still available, I believe. Up till October 31st is what people are hearing. I'm, I'm assuming they're going to extend it because so many communities haven't taken care of it. But it's a big problem right now. And the big thing is some people have to reach into their pocket to do the initial contact with an engineer or a lawyer without any real guarantee they're going to be recompensed for it. You understand what I'm saying? That um, the one community that's really worked within Georgia on this uh, was an association and they've done this and I think we're moving forward in the right direction, but it took some guts on the part of some people to put some bucks down on the table themselves personally, and then get reimbursed. Okay. You understand what I mean? I had a, a group come in the other night and they were upset because they say, I have no money to put down and have an engineer come in and speak to a lawyer about this subject. So I, it's a very serious issue. And I, I think the regional planning commission could, could help us on this by, and I, I appreciate Dean reaching out to me and I, I will certainly follow up on that. Thank you. And I'll, I'll try to keep my mouth shut for the rest of the evening. Thanks. It does sound like a significant issue and um, there may be ways that we can seek to address it um, more efficiently through one of our committees um, um, where it can be handled on a more continual and organized basis than than um, here at at the board level, um, just just a thought for Catherine or someone else to, to ponder. Um, anything else on on the uh, the legislative changes before we move on? Okay, the next item is um, the uh, fiscal year twenty five committee assignments. Uh, the proposed assignments are. Uh, relating to standing committees, and they're in your board packet at page 15, and um, the board needs to approve these assignments. So um, this is an action item for us, um, uh, and uh, so I just I would ask if anybody has any comments on the uh, proposed assignments, and if not, does someone want to make a motion? Peter, I'll... I'll make a motion we accept the board appointments as written. Second. Collectively. I'll second. Any 
Discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Nay? Any abstentions? The motion passes. The next one is the uh, fiscal year 25 transportation planning initiative. Um, uh, Harold, is that something you're gonna address or, or Catherine? I believe that uh, Catherine uh, probably is more uh, suitable for <laughs> proposing how we wanna go about this, Catherine. Do you all forget that Bethany's here? <laughs> well, Bethany, yes. Bethany's our transportation person. Well, or, former former transportation planner. Um, former transportation, and we don't see you anymore. I know, but what, what I would say, so Kyle Grenier, our transportation planner, um, he was the staff member that completely worked on this year's yes. work program in concert with the Transportation Advisory Committee. However, um, many of the tasks are similar from years past. So if folks have any questions about specific tasks, um, myself or other members of the TAC can probably address them. I will say in your packet where uh, Kyle has an overview of the budget and then has included the work program where he has struck out tasks that have gone away and has underlined new tasks. Uh, one of the big things that I will just highlight is from the budget amount, uh, it appears that our you know, our contract is going down. However, that is because we had some special one-time projects in fiscal year FY24 that are wrapping up. Um, and so for FY25, we do, we do have some special projects um, and we did receive a 3% increase in our core TPI funding for FY25. Um, and again, just to remind folks, this is following the federal fiscal year. So this work program will begin October 1st and go through June. I uh, know, so September 30th, 2025. And I'll toss it back to the chair to, if you want to um, call on folks for questions. Yeah, I mean, is there any further discussion? Barbara, go ahead. I have a very silly point to make that I think got overlooked on page um six of this piece or page 22 of our packet line 247 is prefaced with an h and if we're striking d then efgh should be relettered to d e f g it really petty sorry <laughs> nope absolutely we'll make a note of that and when kyle does the final version those will automatically format but we'll make a note to make sure those are in order uh, the work plan looked quite good to me um, I, since we're just since he's going to do a final update if on the last page, uh, George should be changed to Georgia on line 410. It says George South Village Transportation Master Plan. I think that should be Georgia. Yes, correct. Got it. Fine tooth comb these folks have. And, and I will mention what I forgot to mention is the reason why Kyle's not here to present the work program um, and answer the questions is he is in uh, Greenville, South Carolina at a national rural transportation planning conference where he is also sitting on a council for that for that organization and representing Vermont. Yeah. So he, he has a good excuse. And he does a great job. Yeah. And we so many you. of you read your packet in great detail. And this is wonderful. indeed. <laughs> okay. Uh, does someone want to make a motion? I well, assume just so that I, I know that I read this properly, anything that's in highlight was added. Is that true? Uh, highlights, that I believe, yes. Highlights, I believe, were added. Uh, some stuff was strike, uh, okay, uh, lined and taken out. There's very few changes. Thank you. Harold, do you want to make a motion? Uh, sure, I'll make the motion and ask the uh, full commission to approve the work plan as presented before you this evening. I'll second that. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor signify by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? The motion carries. Um, the next item is the St. Albans Town Growth Center planning exercise. And I guess, Greta, you're presenting this? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I refer to your memo and a memo and a few maps that were included in your packet. Um, Chittenden County RPC received a uh, a large uh, raise grant from the Department of Transportation, the U.S. Department of Transportation, to complete regional transit-oriented development plan for Greater Northwest Vermont. So TOD, as transit-oriented development is referred to as TOD, is the concept of creating compact, walkable communities linked together by transit and that have the density to make transit feasible. The project consists first of planning and developing regulations for TOD in 10 communities in the greater Northwest Vermont region, including uh, real estate market analysis. And then later in phases include exploring feasible transit solutions, funding and management structures. So that's gonna happen in the next, like the second part in another year or two. And so St. Albans Town applied and was accepted into the program and has recently kicked off the master planning phase of the project. They've hired a consultant, and then um, all of the regional planning commissions have a role at the table in sort of working with the consultant and the town. And uh, since they're working, the area that they're working on is also the regional growth center, as currently designated in our regional plan. They're interested in hearing input from regional commission commissioners. So thank you, Megan. Megan's here tonight, too, um, <laughs> uh, in uh, sort of bringing this to the commissioners. Um, but it's an opportunity to uh, do a similar exercise that was done at um, a public engagement event earlier this month. Um, the questions were designed to help the consultants learn more about the community and the area in question um, ahead of planning workshops that are planned for later in September. So uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to share the map. And I'd like to go around the room and hear from anyone that would like to share areas, locations, or features on the map. Uh, we'll do strengths first, and then we'll move to weaknesses and great areas in greatest need for planning. And I'll make these notes and we'll share them with St. Albans Town and the consultants. Um, I'm gonna generally, I know we're at 8.03 now, and I, you know, I'll put sort of a rough five minute time limit on each, um, category. And uh, you're welcome also to um, raise your hand or just put it in the chat. Um, and we'll go we'll go for it that way. And I will mark as you, if you if you note an area, I will mark it on the map that I share in a moment. And I will also note that um, the consultants purposefully did not define or put boundaries around these terms. So when you note the area that you would like to feature, um, you also could just briefly explain why, but super briefly, <laughs> so we can um, end the meeting um, without going too long. And so I am going to share the map right now. This is I'm so I'm, I'm this was obviously an in person exercise that I'm doing my best to adapt. Um, to a Zoom experience. Can everyone see the map? Yes. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions on the information that I just presented relating to the project? Not right now. Okay. And Sean, if you could help me if there are any chats um, because I can't see them with my screen right now. So um, feel free to just chime in or raise your hand. Uh, we can start with strengths. Are there any areas um, that you'd like to call out as particularly strong, um, either in the north area of the growth center on the map um, or the south end area of the growth center on the map? So these are the areas that are in the St. Albans town. Uh, municipality. Obviously, a growth center traverses St. Albans Town through St. Albans City. Um, 
during the uh, planning exercises, um, certainly there were some areas in St. Albans City that were pointed out um, as relevant. You know, it's 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 one big community in some ways, um, two municipalities. Uh, is, this, is there anyone that would like to step up and say, well, I'd like to point out this area as being particularly strong? It could be um, an area, a, a property, a neighborhood. It could be um, a community facility, a place. Yeah. Greta, Greta, could you move to the north for me, yep. please? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to orient myself. Oh, wait a minute. So sorry. Got my directions backwards. Go to the, <laughs> the south. So sorry. Yeah, um, so this is exit 19 right here. This yeah. is the interstate access road, Route 7. And then, so that slightly pink area to off of Roots. So what this is, is the, the industrial park? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the um, the dotted dark red line? This is the growth center boundary in our in um, our regional plan. Okay. So, so I think a uh, really important part of St. Albans Town and the region in general is the sports complex that's in that pink area. Yeah. So Collins Pearly, I'll put a yes. green dot right there. I would echo as well the Hardak with the pool area. And, and coming from Fairfax, I feel like it's not really my place to mention much about what St. Albans Town should do, but but I do know many community members who do use both the Collins Pearly as well as the Hardak swim area for recreation. So if we're looking great. at transportation tie-ins and stuff, Fair Fairfax linkings would be great. Cool. And I, th I think the most obvious thing to me is the Northwest Medical Center, that that's a vital site for many people and a very good location to get to rapidly for most communities and then to get to Burlington if they need greater care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in, in terms of transit, if we're, the pool is a, a good example where the pool previously was in the residential area where lots of people who don't have good access to transportation could walk to the pool and use the facility. It's now in an area where those same people don't have good access to it. And so I think, you know, there should be some thought given to that in any transportation plan. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, oops, I want to teeth that green, but then add another maybe purple dot, which is, sorry. Purple is for greatest need of planning. So that's what I'm going to add for that comment. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to that. throw out that for for greatest need, I, I personally would speak with some history here in Fairfax of transportation that we, we have none. <laughs> so um, anything would be great. And I, I do know that SSTA can can provide individual services, but we don't have any kind of a, a public transit that could be tapped into for someone on any kind of a basis to get places. So right. just, there's 5,000 residents here that could go that way. <laughs> right. Good point. Um, okay, well. Um, is there, sorry, Greta, is there a reason we're ignoring the industrial park? Um, I mean, Ben and Jerry's Superior Technical Ceramics, I can't remember what else is down there, but there are a lot of jobs um, and getting people in and out of there is probably pretty important as well. I was headed there, Barkley. I just was geographically challenged on the north um, and south and obviously having worked for FCIDC who owns that industrial mm -hmm. park. Um, there's a number of employers down there. Yep. Great. Greta, are you going to yes. update this map with that traffic circle that comes off <laughs> from uh, exit 19? Uh, They're installing yeah, right. now? We'll, we'll, we'll just draw that in right now <laughs> as a future improvement. 
um, you know, this is this is just the current conditions. So, okay, thank you. I think yeah. generally a huge problem is that if you're in St. Albans town or St. Albans city, you might be able to get to all of those places, even with ride share. But if you're in any other municipality and you work there, you need health care there, or you want to recreate, uh, if you don't have your own vehicle, or even if you do and you don't really want to use it that much, you'd like to have some sort of more efficient transportation, it does not exist. And if there were some way to link the outer communities to St. Albans, like a circular network or even ride sharing organizations, mm -hmm. I think that would be very beneficial because St. Albans is kind of the center of Franklin County. Right, yeah. So, I mean, these are all really great um, points relating to potential or the need for better transit and even getting to potential transit solutions. And, um, you know, I think that's looking towards the next phases of the project, um, you know, and it's, it's part of the conversation right now um, for sure, but really we're thinking um, about land, you know, walkable mixed use neighborhoods in these areas and, and generally just a basic master plan for these growth center areas in the town. Um, and that would then lead to and support transit. So um, your comments don't have to be specific to transit. They can be specific to just places or uh, site, you know, specific site design, um, pedestrian access, things like that too. So, so, so what, along those lines, is the dotted line on this north, is that actually along the... Um, this is currently the boundary of our growth center. Yeah. Right, but is that also the the rail trail? You're cutting out. Is that also the rail trail? Uh, the rail trail is yes, that is also the rail trail. And so, some sh some thought may want to be given on how we tie the two growth centers, or how the two growth centers get tied together from a pedestrian and bicycle perspective, since the rail trail should serve one of them quite well if spurs are added, right? Okay. Yeah, that's a great comment, um, connecting. And I think St. Albans Town actually does have a lot of really exciting uh, pedestrian and, and bicycle projects going on that are looking at connecting different areas. Um, but yeah, great, great thing to note. Um, any, so we, we've, we've had a, I have a few green dots on the map. Um, any, uh, does anyone want to note any weaknesses, um, er, or areas that are in, um, need of the most planning? I have been struck for many years with planning project review with the Northern industrial area behind the, um, shopping center and I think it's called Franklin County Industrial Development. Franklin Park West. Oh, in this area? Yes, it seems to be really not under any sort of master planning process. It, it seems to have some sort of individual um, development that occurs periodically, but it seems like a great space for there to be uh, more dense housing projects because of the um, opportunities to get food and, and it's not uh, far by various modes, including bicycle to recreation and healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great point. Um, potentially um, creating more of a mixed use to nature in this area that is generally um, more focused on commercial development right now. Greta, also the transportation to the adult daycare center out there might also be quite beneficial to a to an aging population. Mm-hmm. Are you talking about um, on Route 105 over here? 
Uh, no, I was talking more about uh, right next to Northwest Access yeah. TV. Oh, okay. So out, out in this area. Okay, yeah. Correct. Okay. I, well, we've, it's been about 15 minutes in total. Does anyone have any final comments before? And this is just an initial conversation, I think, that will, um, you know, obviously the, the, the Regional Commission is going to have an opportunity to talk more and dive into uh, the Regional Future Land Use Map and categories, uh, as Catherine noted in her presentation earlier, um, and working more with St. Albans Town on this. But I thought this was a really um, great opportunity, um, and I'm thankful that St. Albans Town, Megan and Sean, were um, supportive of bringing this to the commissioners tonight. Hey, Greta, how how far does this go? For example, will it even consider the great benefits that could come from linking Canada to St. Albans by rail? To me, that seems like such a really valuable means to enrich this community here with more enterprise. Yeah, I mean that's interesting. The focus of this um, study is is not necessary is not going to be looking at at Canada primarily. They're going to be thinking about um, commuting commuting primarily from um, the communities that are around Chittenden County to job centers, both within the individual counties and then also to, to the largest job center in Chitt Chittenden County. Um, and so, I mean, I don't, you know, it's exciting to think about where that might go and where that might lead. And so. I guess to in answer your question, maybe that will lead to further conversations around um, connections to Canada, um, but that's not the focus of this conversation. Um, so I think a brief discussion, if anyone else has any final notes, one more, one more before we close. Um, but if not, I think this is um, some great initial feedback and I will pass it on to uh, the town and to the consultants. And thank you. You're on mute, Peter. Great job presenting this uh, very elaborate, uh, challenging subject in a, in, a, in a very succinct way. That was, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we've run out of agenda items, but in the immortal words of our former chair, I think there is one last motion. That, oh, no, we've got commissioner announcements. Excuse me. Evans. Any commissioner announcements? Well, let me add good news for uh, folks commuting from Bakersfield, East Fairfield, Route 36 through Fairfield Center is now open. The bridge is complete. Hmm. Any others? Yeah, Howard? I was going to say, I think your, your first uh, chair of the meeting went exceedingly well. And if no one else has anything, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn the meeting at uh, 818. Okay. Thank Second. you, Peter. Second. All in favor, say aye and have a good evening. Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Good night. Good night.